You guys ready? Yeah. All right. So first of all, let's just kind of redo introductions and talk about you know what what type of teaching you guys have been doing lately, and, and, and then we'll get into some more specific questions. Timothy, I work for an online company. It's actually the largest boot camp. It's called Block.io. You can go there. Um, technically, I'm like a lead mentor, so I'm supposed to be mentoring other mentors, but I've taken like eighty plus I've lost count of students through the course of the whole curriculum that they work online. It starts out very much like Code Academy, where you're coding in the browser and you focus on the Rails part. We'll also be doing JavaScript Angular here pretty soon, but so I do that, and so then it becomes very much focused mostly on how to build one pretty robust project and then we do projects. So it starts out very teachering become very mentoring or a junior, a senior dev working with a junior dev. Right? So that's kind of the background of where I come from. Yeah. And I'm Chris. I'm the uh, Ruby instructor for the Iron Yard here in Indianapolis. Um, the way our program works is we're over 12 weeks. The first nine weeks, four days a week, I lecture in the morning for three hours. It's a lot of yakety yak when you go out and work in. Um, in the afternoon of all those days, it's homework. I get done with my yakety in the morning. And then I give you homework, you do the homework, it's due the following morning. On Thursday, that homework is due on Monday. So the lab projects are generally much bigger things, and sometimes like team projects and that sort of thing. Um, and then the last three weeks of the course are final projects, which is what all my students are in now, where it's like, that that's sort of the graduation requirement. It's like you've taken everything you've learned over these last nine weeks, and now you can build something valuable and useful and awesome at the end of it. And then we have a demo day where people can come and see what everybody built and all that sort of stuff. September 18th, by the way, is demo yep. day. What time? Uh, it's lunch time. So it's 11 11 30. 11 to 1.30. 11.30 to 1.30. I encourage everybody to come down. That would be awesome. And where is that? Um, we are at 475 East Market Street, which is in the artist room. Cool. Chris, you have, to tell, you have to say, how do you always tell me where you're located when I forget and everybody ask you where you're located again? Downtown. You always say, you know, by, the, by the chicken and waffles. Joint. Oh, yeah. <laughs> block, block south of Maxine's chicken and waffles. He's there a lot. Well, city market for you. Yeah, <laughs> market for everything. Yeah, right by where market for I'm Dave or Davey for disambiguation purposes. Um, I teach Ruby and JavaScript, including Angular and soon Node at 1150. Um, at 1150, the classes, most of the classes, including all the ones I've talked so far, are seven day, 12 hour a day uh, intensive classes. Um, the, the idea, there's this vision of uh, people taking kind of an introductory course, the very first introduction program period, take a few weeks off, one mess on your own, go into an intermediate class, which would be uh, some of the ones I teach, and then when you feel like you messed with that, Take a more advanced course and then do a teaching teach an advanced course in November. Um, so that is the idea. In practice, some people do kind of the, the equivalent of like um, Olive Garden's Tour of Italy. They just do the tour of code and they take, they take Python, they take Ruby, they take JavaScript, they take iOS, they take Android right in a row. Um, and I don't, I, don't, I don't know what state your mind is in when you finish that. Um, I can tell you what state a person's mind was in when they took iOS as their very first programming experience uh, doing Swift. Seven days, two hours a day. The very next day, starting seven days of, of uh, I believe that was JavaScript. Um, you could see his brain melting out his nose. <laughs> 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 at, least, at least it was Swift. All right. yeah. This is true. All right. Cool. All right, so I'm going to try to throw you guys uh, a couple softballs to start off. Uh, I'm going to combine these two questions, actually, because I think it will be more interesting to answer them uh, uh, in concert. What is What have you found to be the hardest part of teaching programming? What have you found to be the easiest? Uh, here was some baseball, but Davey on the spot first. <laughs> and it doesn't have to necessarily, well, mm -hmm. the real answer is people, but beyond that, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the answer to both of that. Um, <laughs> that's such a, so open-ended. Um, there are a lot of hard parts. Um, 
So some, some of it's just the way it's just the, yeah. <laughs> some, some it's just the psychological game you play with yourself, um, especially during the prep time. Um, and I know there'll be probably a more specific question on this topic, but like the fear of going into this, knowing you don't know, or feeling like you don't know very much about the topic, and being afraid that by the end of the first day, they're all going to know you're a fraud because their questions are immediately going to get too hard for you, and stuff like that. So some of those psychological games are kind of the hardest part. Um, and being able to, to manage um, the gap between you know, the slowest student and the fastest student, or the different learning styles that people have. The easiest part is, is kind of also people, like, like you said. Um, just human interaction, if you're human interaction is something you're good at, and it's great practice if you're not good at it yet. Because, um, you know, people are human beings, and most of them, you know, they're not there to act with you. They're paying money, um, in the case of these classes anyway. Um, so hopefully they're motivated and they want to get along with you. Um, hardest is probably remembering what it was like when you first started programming. Like if, when you've been doing this for a while, there's a lot of stuff you forget. Like the first two weeks of my course are generally just straight up Ruby, like no Rails, nothing else is like classic. Yeah, it's all that sort of stuff, and you sort of have to reset your brain to like. Where you were eight, nine, five, however many years ago it was when you first started getting back into that mindset, being able to explain it to someone who, who might not understand necessarily variables or loops or any of that sort of basic concrete structure that everything else is sort of built on. Um, that's hard. And as far as actually teaching, like, innumerable messes people's heads up. Uh, um, <laughs> rocks and landers. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Yeah, that's <laughs> Um, well, we um, and then uh, polymorphic relationships. Just um, nothing. Um, huh? APIs. APIs. I had to read them a couple of times just for the concept to come through. The first time you thought out, we all had yeah, like stairs. Like, I don't know what you just said. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the the easiest is probably the mentoring, like the lab time. I absolutely love that to be able to help people work their way through and explain specifically how to get past whatever problem they're at. Um, that's both, it, less, well, it's fun, which makes it easy, if that makes any sense. It might not always be easy, right here. It's fun, so it's easy. Cool. Um, you said no people, but it is surprising how psychological it is. Uh, I'm surprised about it more every day. But, as far as like, if you want to be specific to like Rails, in Rails, you have is like, especially if you can get into Rails, or like, like recycling center happening on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Stop moving, French. Uh, what you face with Rails, what I see a lot is like, even once they get farther into understanding how Rails works, they actually, because we omit so much of the syntax, like curly brackets and stuff, it's just, it's just words on the page, and it takes a long time for you to say, this is a hash. This is a class method with a hash argument in Rails, right? And, but it's, and so these, what's actually happening while they're coding takes a really long time for them to grasp, because I think Ruby lends its way towards to really nice, pretty syntax, but when you do, like those curly brackets help you understand what's going on, and stop omitting them, especially when you train Ruby, you put the, you know, we put the curly brackets in there, and all of a sudden they're just gone everywhere. And so that's that's really one of the biggest gaps. Also in Rails, like I'm amazed at how people just don't understand the play between controller and reviews. It's just it goes on for a long time. Um, I don't know if there's an easiest. <laughs> it's all living back there. I mean, I will say this. I will say this. As I've gotten people that are really new to Ruby, what I've found is like using analogy or word pictures is usually a lot more effective for stories. Um, and so over time, I've now developed stories and also very like one, one point, two points. This is what you got to remember, and this will cover ninety percent of what you do here. And early people need that guidance to like give them kind of a couple rules to follow until they get the bigger picture. Because the hardest part they don't have is the bigger picture of what's going on. 
and the whole web scheme of things just in Rails as a whole. And so you have to give them directions that can go easy processes to follow until they get the bigger picture developed. Can I ask a follow-up question? Um, yeah. So one of the things you said yeah. um, was about, about putting putting yourself in that mindset when you were first learning. Yeah. Um, so I know for me, uh, this is the case, and I'm wondering if, if it is for you guys, if you if you felt like it would have been so much easier if this had been explained this way. Yeah. So I want to teach so I can do that part right. Because that would have saved me so much trouble. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And even for like cohort to cohort. I already have things yeah. that I learned from this one. It's like I know a way better way to explain that now, but it does me no good because I taught that eight weeks ago. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Next time. <laughs> so you touched on this already, but uh, this is a question that came up in the channel today, which is George. Um, so does, there, does everybody know what imposter syndrome is? Mm -hmm. All right, cool. <clears throat> so the question was, like, many, many of us probably suffer from imposter syndrome from time to time. So when you are going to teach something that maybe for whatever reason, imposter syndrome or not, you feel like you haven't fully mastered yourself, like how do you handle that situation? How do you, how do you either overcome that or, or teach that effectively in uh, we can start at this end. Yeah, right? so what we do in our course, I mean, we, I think in every course, because right now we're trying to get developers up to speed really quick. I mean, that's the goal that we're all doing. And so basically, you know, we have different paces, so you can do it in like the, just a the review part 12, 24, 36, uh, 12, 18, or 36. But in the foundation part where we just slammed you for weeks of info, like there's always this, I get an email, it used to be on a, they changed, we changed curriculum recently, but it used to be on my checkpoint 40, I get this email, I will never be able to do this, I suck, why, why don't I get this, right? And it's every time, it's like, and so at first it was hard for me to answer this, and I know even like new mentors that like join blog and face this, they, they're kind of taken aback, I don't know what to tell this person, do they, are they not good? But what I've seen at the time, seeing it repetitive and repetitive, I'm like, I can now say, like, hey, I've only experienced this with 80 other people, that everyone said the exact same thing to you. This is part of the process. You're going to hit frustration. And I think that reassurance, so number one, what I found is too, the psychology of it is you have, even if you're unsure as an instructor, you must be confident, right? And so just portraying the confident of, and describing it as if this is normal, like helps them get through that. But it's like a constant, you become a coach psychologist at that point. So it's kind of like mentally and emotionally push them through that. Yeah. Um, as far as dealing with it in myself, like it, it doesn't matter. Like the next lecture starts at nine and I, I have to cover this. <laughs> so okay, well, shit, I'm gonna get an extra pot of coffee in me and we're just gonna go. Um, <laughs> um, and I, I but I intentionally and most times not make a, most of my lectures are live coding. So I intentionally less than I intend to um, make mistakes along the way. So they can see like mo like a lot of what this class is, and I joke about this many times, is learning to Google and understand error messages. That's what most of programming is. So being able to see me go struggle through that at the same time sort of builds up that reservoir of like everybody does this because imposter syndrome as you talked about is something that all of us at one point or another and sometimes interact with it all the time struggle with and it's when you realize that that everybody in this room probably unless you're a psychopath um at some point <laughs> <laughs> no offense um at some point it's not laughing <laughs> I was, I was at uh, Dave's 1150 class, and during one of the breaks, one of the students came to me and went, oh, he's Googling everything on this other screen. Who <laughs> 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 did that? I didn't do it on the main screen. He does it on the main screen. We're all done. We've done a good lesson on how to Google stuff. Yeah. So, I mean. Because that's what a lot of it is. Um, and it's, and I stress that from very early on, like it's, everybody struggles with even when like doing pre-entrance interviews, it's like one of the things I ask is like, how comfortable are you with frustration? 
because that's what most of this job is. <laughs> you will be frustrated a lot of the time. The first time you write anything, it will likely not work. And uh, you have to learn to sort of live with that. Like, you're going to struggle in this class. It might not be right away. It might be when we get the rails. It might be sometime later. But at some point, you will be wanting to pull your hair out, beat your head against the wall, and quit. And I don't want you to quit because everybody does this. It's part of the job. It's part of what you have to do. And that learning to deal with that level of frustration constantly is really that Googling and error messages are what the, I'm really teaching. I teach syntax because I have to. <laughs> yeah. but, but really, the lesson to take away is you can figure this out. We really all do error driven programs. Oh, yeah. Don't talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot. I actually had a conversation today where I wrote a bunch of code and then had someone else look at said code you know, yeah. or as I was writing it after I wrote it. And I was like, no, this is all theoretical. Like, I haven't actually run this code. Yeah. So, like, I, this probably isn't going to work. And he goes, oh, I love that moment. Yeah. You just wrote code, and you yeah. just wrote it, and you're like, oh, this is great. This feels good. <laughs> that moment right before you run it and it airs out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's every lecture that we practice. Yeah. <laughs> I get that moment every morning. But, yeah, but isn't there an imposter syndrome towards teaching it of like the yeah. first time like as a men like starting out as a mentor and I was pretty new to even grow and I started wondering like what the crap am I doing right there. And at first you're like, I gotta look like I'm really good, right? And then you realize that it is an important part to show them that you're just human and you don't know all the answers and that's how it works. The, the other thing that helps is that you remind yourself that I'm training junior developers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not senior developers. So I was like, oh, there's a base level of like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, that, that is one of the things about teaching beginners. Once you've done it once and you kind of realize, oh, good, they're not just here to, to heckle me and to grill me, some of the fear some of the fear goes away. But I have to admit, the first, so Dave Jones developed. Um, both of the courses I teach now with me um, and taught the first couple of instances with me. Um, the first time we did each language, we were just terrified the whole week. We were frantic and staying up. I mean, we were 12 hour classes, so we were staying up till one or two in the morning, uh, uh, rewriting the next day's material based on what we found. Um, but yeah, um, like, like Chris said, a big part of dealing with that is just accepting it is okay not to know the, the answers and it is okay to let them know that you this isn't something you know off the top of your head and you know when i would when i remember to do so i would pull uh, open up another browser tab on the screen that they could see and, and show them what it's like to look that kind of thing up show them where the api docs are tell them what the heck api docs are um, and how to how to make sense of those so um, we write GitHub wikis that accompany our, our projects that are built in class, and um, in those we include we include snippets of the documentation along with the link to kind of walk through that thought process. But the fact that you can do that on the fly and do it live without you have to you have to be determined not to feel embarrassed about it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yeah, it's 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 getting over. Getting over that stuff. And, and you still do feel embarrassed about it? You, you just don't let anybody know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, um, I don't know, I have no idea whose quote this was originally, but um, the best way to learn something is to teach it. I've totally committed to teaching things that I didn't know yet um, <clears throat> with enough lead time. I mean, not like I'm going to teach how to build aircraft carriers, and I don't know how to build a workbench. Um, but, but you know, a particular library, for example, that you're not familiar with, but you're confident in six weeks I can know well enough to teach it to beginners. Um, that scares you to death. I am, I am presently scared to death about this thing because I've done it again. Um, but, but you know, you, you deal with it. It's going to be okay. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, and even even if it's not okay and you have a horrible lecture, like, it doesn't matter. At noon it's over and you're gonna come back tomorrow morning at night and do it all over again. <laughs> so it's like it's that's still. the hard thing about eleven fifty, twelve hours long, yeah. I don't get them. And yeah. when you have a really large class, there is a line of like ten people who have questions for you at each fifteen minute break. So um, So you wear a like space diaper. 
I intentionally have rules that are like if I'm if I'm going for a walk or if I'm uh, at lunch, like I'm off limits. Yeah. Yeah. So this last time I had yeah. a, I had a I came up with a method which is because the 1150 classes are uh, the Jones residence, um, Scott Jones ridiculous mansion. Um, because I'm an out of town teacher, I could like stay in the private part of the house in the bedroom. Um, so I had a key card to that. They didn't. Um, their keys didn't open that door. So I'd like run real quick. <laughs> I'd just like run up to my, the bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> Use the bathroom there. Yeah. That's the key to imposter syndrome. So we kind of covered this, but I'm interested to, to call it out a little bit more specifically. Um, technically speaking, what what is the thing about Ruby that uh, that has most like bent your students' minds? Let's start in the middle. Okay, as I already mentioned, like innumerable. Like collect, inject, which I accidentally introduced on the second day of class. Because <laughs> <laughs> I love inject, it's so much fun. Right. And I wanted to sum some numbers, <laughs> so I'm like inject, um, and then spent the rest of the week re-explaining inject, and then over the next couple of weeks, occasionally I would re-explain inject. <laughs> um, what actually ended up working for explaining a lot of those was to break them down into each loops. So this is what inject does. Like you have a number up here, and then you go loop over with each. And then you're going to add this particular thing to that, and then you're going to return it, right? So breaking them down to each, which everyone understood really well, helped make that a bit more concrete to figure out what, you know, collect and select and reject and all the wonderful, yummy, innumerable goodness, how all that works. Um, again, polymorphic relationships, active record relationships in general are a little bit wonky. Um, and then the, the other big thing when you get to Rails is like knowing where to put stuff. Like, does it go in the model, or does it go in the view, or does it go in the controller? And figuring out how to like architect projects and that sort of thing, that's still really tough even as a working in final project. That's tough for me. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's something I should probably mention more often. <laughs> There's not any black and white line between any of this. It's all fuzzy. And it's like, whatever makes sense to you. <laughs> right. Dan and I spent half the morning um, whiteboarding a directory structure for a project. Isn't that fun, though? It is fun. Yeah. You get to think about it without actually having to write it. That's right. That's the job I want. Yes. Which way are we going? Jenny, you have a question. Oh. Yeah, I was wondering, do you guys, um, when you're, I mean, obviously teaching like introductory, you've got this like fine line between computer science versus application, and obviously your goal is to get them more like a real world application. Do you guys touch on more of like the theory? Do you get into like, Discussing procs versus blocks versus lambdas and how that you know can go between different languages. Like, do you do you get into that at any point, or is that like I'm teaching a junior developer? I, I don't really expect them to. Well, I like I expect them to have a curiosity of it beyond that time to Google. Like, yeah. where, where's that fine line for teaching? So, so for me, I do do a little of that um, at a non-language specific level, yeah. specifically on that topic, because. It just so happened that the first, our first Ruby cohort, we knew ahead of time that about, about half the audience was coming from one company, and um, they were super, super interested in the block, proc, proc, lambda thing. So we spent a little time talking about the concept, the generic concept, concept of a lambda or a closure, what it means to be a closure, what that means as far as variable scope goes, which, you know, you have to talk about a few other things before you talk into that. That was not a day one conversation. Um, but we did do a little of that, like when we teach JavaScript. I mean, you've got to use them a million times because there are so many callbacks to be passed to things, even if like, you're just doing like jQuery on each. Um, so we talk about it a fair amount, show enough examples, and then um, we, we did even get into the difference between props and lambdas. Um, in our in our Ruby class, sometimes not every cohort is the same. Sometimes it's clear that the audience is just not ready for that, or is not interested in that. But we still still try to talk about some things at a non-language specific level. Like other languages might call this thing this thing. Yeah, I, I drop that sort of stuff. Like, this, like I talk about blocks a lot because it's Ruby and blocks everywhere and they're wonderful. 
So you have to talk a lot about blocks. I think I mentioned props maybe once, just as an offhand, because it's again it's junior developers. It's like that's something that you don't really need all that much until it becomes a pain point, and then you have a specific need to use it. You might want to get this little pipe and arrow thing, and then you go and then you go down lamp to lamp. Yeah, um, but yeah, I think I mentioned that once, and I do spend a lot of time, especially when we get to the week of JavaScript. Like one of the assignments is this assignment we did on week two, which was Ruby. Now do a JavaScript. Um, so that because that's really how you learn another language is you take something you know in a language you know, and then you do it in another. Um, so I do spend a lot of time talking about like hashes. If you're in Python, this would be a dick. Um, all that sort of stuff, sort of layer across to get across the point that once you know one language, they all solve similar problems in very similar ways in a lot of cases. So, kind of pointing out that even though this is a Ruby class, you should be able to get out of this and pick up Python fairly quickly, um, pick up JavaScript really, really quickly, um, all that sort of stuff. As I in my last cohort, 10 of the 22 students had just finished a week of Python. So, I was able to say, you know, you may have seen this in Python, so it's the same way here. Do the same thing. There's a couple things that I've seen over time, and I finally got to where I classified. I was like, there's either feature level programming or framework level programming. And so, what we used to do is we used to, in our curriculum, do procs and lambdas. And what I learned is any feature that the foundation hasn't been built for, or there's not a practical use for, um, there's absolutely no way to it. And so, um, what we've done some is like I might introduce a topic. So, if you ever see this in your future Ruby life, you're not like, what the heck is this? Um, but as a whole, it, it's, it's not going to be needed. And it, it, the time that you spend on it, and until you build the foundation, it, it, it's it's impossible. I mean, yeah. unless a person's like just mentally sh super sharp, which happens sometimes, but the majority of people, they're just not ready for it. I mean, it took me a long time to really yeah, exactly. grasp Lambda's as a whole, yeah. anyway. Um, and I mean, someone even asked me one time, when did you get rails? I was like, a year and a half to mentoring them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so. I, and, and I tell people, I'll like, you know, even when we've done, like, use the uh, ampersand as a switch from block to proc and stuff, and you're doing um, that whole thing. And actually, our curriculum does the same thing. Where we, do, yeah. we make you do everything with each first and show you yeah. how pain of an ass it is. And then, yeah, here's a really nice method that just does that. Um, but so, part of that, too, is like, you get doing this really fast. Some of the things that we shortcut um, people is like, Understanding what the problem is that this feature in an applicate in a programming language is solving, right? So like, why do I need a block? What is it? You know, does that even matter, right? So why do I need a lambda, right? And I mean, they're, they're nobody really close to that. Right? Yeah. So you have to relate it to something concrete of some sort. Yeah, you have to have right. something something where a lambda is the solution. Yes. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So you know, like I said, so it's got to be a problem. You got to have a practical application. Really, you have to have the mental foundation built for them to even get it. So yeah. other than that, I mean, so it, no matter what you go over, um, it can be anything. If, if your goal is to go over Prox and Landers, you just better build a foundation for it. Yeah. I think yeah. maybe, maybe an example of what you're asking about, or I will just use this as an excuse to brag on Dave, because this is one of my favorite parts of our Ruby class. Um, we do, since it's only seven days, we spend the weekend doing playing Ruby with no rails. And the last project that we do, uh, framework free, is build a tiny application server that loads up ERB templates and populates them, responds to HTTP requests, that kind of thing. So you, when you fire up Rails, you can say, this piece of an MVC framework solves this problem that we did manually, et cetera. So yeah, that's a good example. So another question from the Flowdoc channel uh, from Alex, who is not here. So I'm going to give him shit for that later. Uh, it's kind of a series of questions. I'm going to read them all to you and let you guys kind of tackle them as you see fit. But the general category is like, how, how do I learn to maintain an application? Uh, and the reality is that most of what we do is, is maintenance work, not green field work. 
if you're a consultant, you might be lucky enough to greenfield an app a few times a year if you're really lucky. Um, but most of the time, you're just coming onto a project, even as a consultant, and <coughs> tackling it. Um, so here's what he has. I always want to know if there's a way to learn how to inherit a project or an app. How, to, how, how would I identify code that is not going to be easy to maintain before I agree to maintain it? <laughs> the best of luck. Uh, and what questions can a developer that's still learning ask to help identify some of these yeah. scenarios? Well, the, to the first question, somebody, I swear somebody just tweeted this um, like an hour or two ago. The hardest part of writing code is still reading code. Was that someone in the room? Did no, it's it Nate Acuff. Okay, Nate Acuff. Yeah. I knew it was somebody local that knew. Yeah. Hell is other people's code. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> other, other people includes me yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, be, because I have I have 12 weeks to work with as far as maintaining, I get them to maintain the applications. Like we do our weekend lab and then I keep them in that app through the next week. So they get that experience of once Thursday rolls around, this thing's feeling kind of crafty, you know, and it's like you have to figure out a way to add this other feature to it that's like, well, this feels wrong at this point. Um, also did one assignment where it's like, you got somebody else's code to build the next thing onto. To sort, you know, I have 12 weeks to play with, so I can do a lot of that sort of stuff. Because um, uh, I think that's the sort of thing, as far as like learning how to take over one, you have to do it. Which is true of most of this programming stuff. In order to learn it, you have to do it. I'm just going to text that to Alex real quick. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as far as the other question is, um, most maintainable code bases you will ever find are ones that have tests. Like if you walk into an application that has good test coverage, you can get up and running in no time at all, and it's fantastic because you know you're not going to break anything if the tests are good. Um, then, so one of the questions you can ask is, are there tests? And if any answer at all, <laughs> yes, some, um, that's fine because it's going to be better than most. Um, that's and fine. run them. Don't just see. Oh, yeah. oh, there's a test folder with lots of subfolders. <laughs> yeah, right, right. They're all scaffolded. They don't do a thing. <laughs> But another thing, if you this doesn't help with determining whether something is maintainable, but it can help you with the maintenance if you have no choice, or if you have a little time to play with it before you decide, yes, I'm going to take this on, um, is uh, throwing um, breakpoints all over the place, using pry, do a bunch of binding dot primes. Um, Stick that in there, there to see you know, what local variables do I have at this stage and what do they hold? What is this supposed to do? And that can help you figure that out too. Um, yeah, if it's a Rails app, just opening the thing up and kind of poking around. Yeah, poking around the directory structure. Say, no, these are the models. And, yeah, these are the models. These are the models. And okay, we have, we have 60 folders under app with a million design patterns. I'm not talking about any, any app in particular. Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> 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 I can throw things like uh, RuboCop at it, or Metric mm -hmm. Foo, or pop yeah. it into uh, Code Climate, or something like yeah. that as a nice first pass. Yeah. And then also like look for any things that are not idiomatic and be like, oh, this is clearly something different, something special. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also looking at Git commit histories can be really easy. Oh gosh, that's a big one. What yeah. do you look for? If you have good, if you have good commit messages. Yeah. That's that's a clue that it might be yeah. pretty easy to maintain. Yeah, and you can also look for like flurries around particular areas of the application or particular days. Like if you get like five of them in a row, they all purport to be fixing the same damn thing. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> um, that that could be a bit of a clue that maybe this isn't what we talked about. You're saying you wouldn't be able to maintain and fix bugs in. Um, if somebody tried five times and still didn't fix it, don't fix it. And like three of the messages are just lol. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fix a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Yes. They just start to become questions. Maybe this will work? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lots of water. Every, everything <laughs> begins WIP. Everything begins WIP. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The commits are months apart, and when you open them, it's like an entire new app was built inside of it somehow. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's lots of sort of code archaeology that can be done around it to figure out whether something really a well maintainable, an app that's easy to maintain is one that's already been well maintained. 
So potentially, you, someone yeah. should go to user voice right now and ERB at user voice.com and suggest code archaeology as a uh, yeah, topic of the future. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do say, like, having, so like, we have them build a lot of projects, but they build odd projects with complexity in it, as in, and then I think it's important to let them write bad code. So oftentimes, so they see bad code and then they try to change bad code um, so that they get like a raw experience with it. Um, I mean, at, at times I have like um, block students through code bases. And so I think a big part of it is, I mean, this is why I like we use the mentorship skill because there's so much translated and then just seeing me on a meeting doing what I would do, right? I'm, it's, I can't even describe all that, right? It's just, there's a transmission of skills just by the viewing of it. Um, and that's highly, highly effective um, for one. But that, I mean, when, but building that complexity and, and having a student which is sometimes, you know, it's like, holy crap, you know, come and they got like, you know, 30 errors, and all, I mean, it's just a mess, right? And, and so you, it's, it's about, it really is about, I think, like, small, like, helping them work through small, narrow processes. Fix this one thing, don't put it off on tangents. And by teaching these little processes, they, they kind of understand what it takes. I think that helps them transmit when they go to another code base. But also, I number one, I see nested ifs anywhere, like, far away. So I, started no trying, what's going in there. so I start I started doing this on purpose in the class in the class that you took actually. Um, where we do we do some refactoring during the course. You know it's only a seven day course. Um, we write we wrote a fairly lengthy controller method and then uh, made it way, way shorter. Uh, extracted some of it, went to the model, some of it went to a private method. Um, but doing those things and saying, that, see, now it's much, much easier to see what this thing actually accomplishes. So doing some of that on the fly is one way to, to teach that a little bit. But also have to rate them, right? Like when they send you really bad 30 line code, and I was like, what the hell is this? Like, what am I even supposed to do with this? You know, and they're like, oh, this is bad. Yeah. And we can kind of discuss, like, <laughs> <laughs> done, like please don't ever actually. Do this. <laughs> yeah. Humiliation is important for yeah. the <laughs> 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 Especially humiliation online. Yeah, yeah. Your code is bad when you do it with a do it with a sense of humor. I think sense yeah. of humor is highly important, especially when you're oh, yeah. small <laughs> 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 you see something. My attention span is not long enough to read the past five lines of code a single method. Right. Yeah. I like to imagine like you, like they just receive a block of text from you that is like, what the hell is this, or something like that. And it's like a, your avatar beside you going. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get really like if they if they get really lazy with their questions because I do have they can contact me and send messaging and they'll just be and if they don't, I got to where like if they don't ask me a question I just and I'll just say okay that's great and then just let it go <laughs> for a while right I'm really good with this you, right. you got you guys should. Uh, See last month's how not to be an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been real quiet. I did ask where you were last month. Um, <laughs> was awesome. I think I was at home. To be very passive aggressive, but they're like, can we do it this way? She's like, sure. For projects. <laughs> Um, okay, one, right, one of them was just wrote. Okay, I had a couple of my developers <laughs> that decided they wanted to build a native iOS app in Swift. It's a Ruby class. I didn't teach Swift, and so I was like, "Yeah, okay, sure, go ahead." <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, Dan, you can tell me whether that motivated you to. Yeah, like yeah. we wanted to prove you wrong. That's great. But yeah, that's the only time I, I think. You know, let me know if I'm wrong. Um, I've used that sort of passive aggressive approach. And it's for very specific. <laughs> I just know for David, it's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so I just know it would like, he'd drive this car off a cliff. Yeah. I, I really, really try not to do that stuff. Um, like, if, if someone suggests something um, that I know better than, for example, in class, I'll, I will do it. I mean, not to humiliate them, to, but to, to try it out and then. 
let's break it down why didn't this work? Yeah. Or how else, or this did work, but how else could we have done it that is more succinct or a little easier to read or whatever? Yeah. So, and you know, remind them, you do this stuff all the time yourself. I mean, I do it all the time. Yeah. Um, write stuff that I know is the lazy way. And then, for, you know, before, if you know someone else is going to be reading your commit, you're like, oh, I'll never be able to get away with this. And, you know, <laughs> and if no one else is reading your commits, <laughs> 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 I, I also <coughs> take suggestions and run stuff that I know isn't going to work because I want to encourage, like, I don't know the answer, just try it. Don't be afraid to yeah, Don't be afraid to make an error message, just type something in there and see what happens. Well, he types that he says, I think this will work. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I say that entirely too much. It's be better. <laughs> I mean, I got, after, like, so I've been doing it for three years, I got to where, I mean, at first, it just yeah, like, get really annoyed with some students, and probably it was just raw backlash of you being stupid. But now I do it, and now I even kind of, like, meditate and say, like, if you took, if you took that kind of non-question question to a senior dev while he's busy, like you went and become a junior dev and you came like with that unprepared of a question, they're just gonna be like, why are you bothering me? You know, like <laughs> you know I mean? most of the time. And so like I use my sarcasm and jerkiness is very strategic. <laughs> so, preparing them for the real world. Preparing yeah. Real world. Yeah. Answer voice strategic jerkism. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. I uh, spoke at a testing conference earlier this year, and um, I told the, the people who are listening to be vulnerable, be be vulnerable, but don't be expensive. And expensive is someone wasting my time on things that you could find out on your own. And I'm going to be less likely to want to help someone later on. I'll be less, um, I don't know, I don't know, understanding with with what they may have. So be vulnerable. The only time I remember making fun of a student was when, for the third time in one afternoon, um, he had asked a question about, what I, uh, are we going to do the thing I just did? This was in your class, too. It wasn't you. The freaking guy was texting constantly. Gosh dang, man. <laughs> if you're going to do that, fine. But then don't waste everyone else's time asking I mean, you know, he was he was a very fast learner, very fast. He was way way ahead of mo uh, most of the class, but but that that made him tune out. It was his freaking mother. This is a high school student. His mother was texting me during the class, and she knew perfectly well. Understood. This is irrelevant. It's more. Like it. <laughs> 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 I, I actually have a specific class rule for students. It's like spend fifteen minutes beating your head against the desk, googling it, trying to figure out an answer, then ask your neighbor. And then the two of you beat your head against the desk and Google it for a while, and then you come to me, and then I'll tell you what you should do. Um, <laughs> 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 you can start the conversation with, well, what do you think you should be doing? Yeah. <laughs> so what? what is now <laughs> at this moment is usually one of the very first questions. Like, what, look at your error message. You tell me what is the end. <laughs> um, and that's, that's been a lot. Yeah, because it happens. Oh. And you have to get really, really good at figuring out well, what was nil. <laughs> Most JavaScript questions are uh, ultimately lead to the value of this, and then you get yeah. What is this? <laughs> yes. It's almost existential. It is. Yeah. <laughs> I got one. We're best. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so I think it might have come up the floor a little bit, but. Switching a little bit from sort of practical, here's the syntax you write, to more kind of the way to do things. Mm -hmm. um, for me, a lot of that stuff is things I learned over the course of years from putting a lot of logic in my views and then learning that that was hard to maintain. To what, for stuff like that, to what extent do you guys rely on just like, it's a convention or like it's just the way we do things or trying to explain why some of that's yeah. Less, you know, less obvious stuff isn't the right way to do it, and if so, how do you explain that? So since even though, even though we only have seven days, part of the 1150 mandate is that we build three free apps. Um, so we usually do it the, um, the we usually do it one way in the first app, and then the second app we learn a better way. So um, we do it the the maybe slightly unconventional, um, but the way that we 
we've already learned enough to do it this way, and then we talk about it the next time. So uh, we do try to do it a little bit better. So you kind of talk through that, like why this right. one's better. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I try to explain, but again, that one's really fuzzy sometimes. So it's like there's, it's tough to explain concretely, like what goes in a partial and what goes in a helper is by far the worst one. Um, is figuring out what, where, where, where does this go. Um, it's like wherever it makes sense to you after a while. Um, and, uh, I try to give some guidelines. Like, it's really super duper small and you're going to use it all over the place. Maybe make a helper method for it so you can just put it in one line. Um, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, and then because I have more time, I'm able to introduce, like, we do a week of nothing but databases and models. So we can talk about models and they're really just classes and all this sort of stuff. So when we talk about what goes in the model. And then we do, before that, we did a week on the controllers and views. So we talked a little bit about like, keep your views as stupid as possible. Um, and at that time, you don't have models to work with, so your controllers might get a little bit easy. And so then the next week, we talk about models, and then it's like, we'll move some of that stuff out of the controller back into the model. Um, so, yeah. I think, you know, with the mentorship model, it's really gets, for me, it's just about taking the current error and having the, like, so number one, I, I teach everyone, like, I want you to go into a place with an opinion, like, what is good code, right? I mean, like, almost like one of the worst things you come in as a developer and just be like, mm -hmm. like, I'd rather you have an opinion even if it's a little annoying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right, but, and so, but, and so oftentimes what I'll say is, like, if it's a convention or say, like, this is how I do it. Yeah. I mean, it may not be the way, and I might even point if you want more resources. This, there, this. Certain kind of people want to read everything. Okay, here's your resources, right? This is where I get it, right? But this is how I do it, and this is why I do it. And so they, so that transmitting that, like, I do things for a purpose. It doesn't necessarily have to be right. It's just, yeah. I, this is my, and I have my conventions, right? I say, this is my convention. You will not read this in a book. You will never find this anywhere else. But this is why I do it. And so, in that case, it's a transmission. And then there's some things that say, like, do you want to program Ruby or Rails? Better for you to do this. Like, you go to any shop, you don't do this. You, you do Can we answer the question? Yeah, no, I guess we just got by this. I like, too, that you make it personal. Like, it's not like, this is the right way to do it, so do it this way. Yeah. It's like, this here's right. why I do it this way. Yeah. All these reasons that make sense. Uh, if you want to do it a different way, Go ahead, but yeah, you know, you like, can like, that. yeah, like even because even like mentors can share and like develop any curriculum and stuff. And I mean, we have you know, it's just like every other GitHub repo, huge opinions clashing all yeah, the time, yeah. right? right. But that's but that's so much better than just like indifference, you know, as a whole. We'd much rather have yeah. that. So, both on teaching that and showing that to like, I, I have a very strong opinion. This is what I want you to develop. I want you to say, like. I did this because I think this is how we always did it. No, I did this because I wanted to do that, right? And if I'm lucky, someone will ask a very specific question, could, could we do this this way? And I'll yeah. have the chance to put the two solutions side by side and say, which one do you think reads better? They're both absolutely fine. Which one do you think is clearer than with that one? Yeah. And then the important thing is, within a single project, you know, establish that that's the convenient for that project. Yeah. So that's yeah. the style. When I say, like, when you said when there's, like, two different ways, I just say pick one. Yeah. I was like, because they'll get, like, analysis paralysis, and, like, I don't know, well, what's right, what's right? I just, just pick one. Like, things yeah. like, do you, I was like, is it okay to put if, then on a single line, yeah. or not? Are ternaries ever to be used? Yeah. 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 So, it depends a lot on where you work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's, you know, that's yeah. kind of the answer. Yeah. Write what you think is clear, and if you're joining someone else's team, you find out what the convention is for that team. So it's much easier for a student that just kind of does, even if it's kind of haphazard, than one that's like timid and not doing it. It's, it's much harder to keep up just code as code. I'd much rather like, hey, I made a big mess, okay, let's talk about it. Now we have real code that we can discuss and talk about. So you, you get a lot farther, like the timid one, you're like, okay, please just code something, put something down. Don't don't be afraid to do it the yeah. non non-idiomatic way. We need a couple more questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like all of your programs are very different in their approach. Like three hours in the morning, and hands-on, more mentor. Like, what have you guys found as far as 
uh, new students grasping the basic concepts. Like I think you mentioned it. Like I've done some mentoring and teaching. It's really frustrating when I spend an hour talking about something and then five minutes later they say, "How do you do this?" And I'm like, that was "Slide number three. Like we just went over that." But then you said, and I agree, you learn by doing. Yeah. So what is that balance of how much do I throw and try to get stuck in your head, and then you go practice versus maybe yeah, smaller chunks and then more doing or yeah. Um, you know, as far as the kind of feedback we get from students, um, inevitably um, there are people saying the whole thing is way too slow, mm -hmm. and people saying the whole thing is way too fast. I was, mm -hmm. I was lost by 10 a.m. on the first day. Yeah. Um, I do, I do think the reality of seven day intensive courses where you build three apps in a week, um, people who are brand new to programming or close to brand new, are not going to have that stuff absorbed. Uh, the best you, I think you can hope for in that situation, unless you're a genius, is um, hopefully it makes sense as we're doing it together. Um, and then when you go and read the documentation um, afterward, read our, our wikis that we built with the projects. Um, you're seeing that all that stuff for a second time, and it makes more sense. And if you tried to, you know, build your own very simple something, whether it's to, I, I can't think of a non-archaic example, like organize your record collection. Um, you know, if you try to build, you know, to build one of those things uh, on your own, even if you're just copying based on code from class, hopefully you're at a point where you would know what to copy. Um, the first couple of and again, I have students in the room, so no offense to it. Yeah, the first couple of weeks. No, I say yeah, no yeah. offense at all. Like, yeah, the first, new the first couple of weeks. How much do you try to pack? Are, in? First couple of weeks are kind of tough. Yeah, oh, I, they are very frustrating because you do get a lot of those sorts of questions where it's like, I, I just talked for three hours, <laughs> and, um, and then I gotta go over it again. But yeah. it, some of it is just like this is in a lot of cases the first exposure to. So there is going to be this level of like, I just don't understand what this is at all. Like just breaking it down logically. That's what a lot of those first two weeks are, like breaking it down into little tiny pieces so that you can they all make sense. Um, and that's really what all of this is. It's break, figuring out how to break a big problem down into little pieces that you know how to do. And that starts from the very beginning. And a lot of times students will look at the homework assignment and go like, this thing's huge and it makes no sense and I'm not going to be able to figure this out and so I'm going to ask a lot of questions. Um, and they gradually learn to break it down into little pieces when they do get little pieces that they understand. Um, and then toward, as the class goes along, the questions get better and better and better. Um, hopefully. So, <laughs> and then one thing I'll do when, like, when I get to the lab, first the lab will just say, accomplish this basically. Yeah. And then after they've had a couple minutes, I'll say, okay, so what's the very first thing you need to do? What's the very first thing you can break this down into? It's this piece, right? Okay. Yeah. No, you haven't gotten that far, do that, and then think about what you can do next. And eventually, you know, before the lab is over, there'll be like five bullet points underneath there, breaking them down into subtasks. Yeah. So hopefully, seeing that enough time, yeah. get, drills that in, maybe should, if it seems overwhelming, break it down. Yeah. The, the other thing I do, you were talking earlier about like, the spread between the advanced students and the high is every homework assignment is three levels. So there's normal mode. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Normal <laughs> mode that's like everybody should be able to do this. Then hard mode that's like, hey, if you got done with that at three in the afternoon, move into hard mode. And then there's nightmare mode for you got done with hard mode at three in the afternoon. <laughs> Feel free to knock yourself out. And generally those break down like normal is exactly what I talked about in the morning. Okay. Hard okay. is a little bit more than that. And nightmare is like, I'm not going to be talking about this at any point. Every once in a while, you'll throw in something you didn't talk about in the normal mode. And oh, what like, shit? Uh, Call me out on that. If you're really good at Nightmare, then start doing speed runs through Nightmare. <laughs> yeah. Shopping carts. So you've had an insane mode once in a yeah. while. Yeah, and then occasionally I've had a fourth one that's beyond that. So. <laughs> I was saying that the, when we were covering language basics, we totally spent a ton of time in IRB and, mm -hmm. and for the JavaScript classes and the in just the console of Chrome. Yep. Um, super helpful to illustrate all the little things over and over and over. And one, one thing I'll do better next time is those first couple of weeks making it go a lot slower so that folks can follow along the time along. Is this, 
especially as we start getting later on, we start getting into the rails, like I, I gotta go faster, I gotta go to ship or stop in three hours. So you can homework, that's all the stuff I'm teaching you this morning. Um, so, uh, but there in the beginning, I really need to go slower so that folks can follow along and can keep up with typing. Because really, like the, the ideal workflow for this, from my perspective, is I explain what it is that we're doing, I do what it is that we're doing, and then you do what it is that you're doing. Um, if I can get into that sort of pattern more frequently next time, I think my phone will get sooner too. Um, one thing is that the, I could say this over multiple versions of curriculum, trying to get it perfect, but the whole team develops to this. Like there is no magic bullet, right? It's going to work for everybody. You can get it pretty tuned for the majority of people, but I mean, I think that's the great of like using the mentorship model because I literally ever, I, I teach the same concepts in a completely different way every day, right? Based and it's really based on where the person's at, what he can, what he or she can understand, um, and so, and then also with that is they understand, they know a lot more almost subconsciously before they know it consciously, right? So like when you push them through a lot of material, they're like, I don't know this, I don't know this, I don't know this. I know this, right? And sometimes I even have to say, look what you know, because that imposter syndrome psychology part kicks in and they're like, and when you keep flooding them with new stuff, and this is what programming is, it's just constantly pelting yourself with stretching your mind with new knowledge, that like you just you get this psychological feel like I always don't know things, right? And so, and then all of a sudden, you kind of like once you get them to a point that you know, so you kind of gotta get a process you trust. And then it's there's this mystery part of it where this inspiration just happens. So like, oh, I get it. Okay, I don't know what really actually did that, but it was a culmination of things, and it's kind of this unwritten thing. And so, you, what I found is you just got to have processes, and you can hone your craft, you can hone how you say things, but it's never going to be perfect, and you never know exactly what's going to be. For the other person, some people take longer and they have to trust you longer that it's going to work out that they're going to get it. Um, and so you got to become more of a psychologist. But also, it helps me because, in a sense, other people write the curriculum. And so, no matter what the curriculum is, even, I mean, because people write bad curriculum sometimes and just stuff. And if it's really bad, I'll just say, that's shit. Right? I'm like, we're not going to code like that. And so, I use it as an example, as a teaching example. So I can kind of be like, okay, we both agree that, that right there is that this section right here, whoever wrote that, and I'll go make a ticket and grab somebody out on GitHub. But I like this. Is, <laughs> like I'm not, I'm not like we're just going to skip this, and I'll tell you why, and I'll explain it. So um, it helps with me that I can like kind of almost like it's another. It's so much psychology. Right? I think the other side like just yeah, let's just ignore this, and so it's kind of this teammanship. So it really becomes like. We're co developers at some point. So I really worked like at first, they really view me as like this you know, huge expert, which I'm just like another person, right? But it's like, whoa, you know. And then by the end, my goal is like, you feel pretty much like we're just partnering on this. So I'm hearing is trash your students, trash your peers, <laughs> yeah, trash your and trash your husbands because we trash everybody out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just reminded something about imposter syndrome. The other thing that once we get to like week seven, which is JavaScript week, which is like we've been doing Ruby, we've been doing Rails, and then we're going to switch and like, hey, time to learn a whole new language. Um, and it tends to be very frustrating. So what I have, what I suggest most frustrated students do a lot of times is like go back and do the homework from week one or week two that you spent like an entire afternoon and evening figuring out that now you can sit down and bang out in five, fifteen minutes, something like that. That really helps illustrate like, how far you've come. And this week might be hard, um, but you can still see how much progress you've made and imagine how much more you can do over the last couple of weeks. One of the things you mentioned that Chris does in class is definitely is definitely a deliberate method. Uh, you come to, come saying, well, what should I do? What do you think you should do? <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, the, I, is that the Socratic method? I'm not sure, but yeah. asking a bunch of questions and, and it's just basically helping you helping you realize that I actually do have enough information to do this. Yeah. Um, my favorites are when I can just ask one question and then no, I turn back around. <laughs> it's like, oh, shit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I do think you have to work in the curriculum and opportunity as you're teaching this. 
no matter how fast you're teaching it, of like success. Yeah. Right. Like it's because like when we were like you coded and I taught myself, right? Like what got me addicted was like, oh my god, that worked, right? Mm -hmm. And that feeling, and then it became like, oh my gosh, I can create stuff, and then I would deal with harder problems and more frustration because I was contradicted at that point. So, yeah. in that same kind of sense, you like you can't push them too fast. You got to let them have success on the way, even if it's really simple success. So, mm -hmm. like, so they get kind of that, oh, this is fun, right? Yeah. See that happening. Yeah. So, sometime in the first week, I want to get that dopamine hit. Yeah. Holy shit, that worked. Um, so I know they'll be able to keep it up through the whole time. I mean, it's, it's nine weeks, it's a long freaking time. And a lot of times, like, the homework is the afternoon, but really, most of the time, like, I've had students messaging me questions at, like, three in the morning. Mm -hmm. It's like, dude, I'm asleep. So it's like, you know, I have students that are working these long hours and everything else. And unless you have that initial dopamine hit of, like, this is actually fun occasionally, and it's a little bit like gambling, it doesn't happen every time, but it happens just often enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, if you don't get that in the first week or two, you're not going to be able to keep up when it really starts getting rough. Well, there are some nights that I'd be coding, I'd look up and go, shit, it's 2.30 in the morning, I probably ought to go to bed. Yeah. yeah. That's what coffee's for. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you touched on this a little bit, uh, in a way, but... Uh, does everybody know what uh, um, the rubber duck method is? Yeah. It's where uh, uh, duck you have a problem, there. and I don't remember who, I don't know who coined it. For whatever reason, they decided to put a rubber duck on their desk. And if they, had, if they were running into a code problem of some sort, they would explain the problem to the rubber duck. Yeah. Like, as if the rubber duck could understand and help them with their problem. And then in having to explain it to someone else, they would go, oh, right, that's what I'm doing wrong, okay. And they would yeah. figure out their problem on their own. So I was just curious yeah. if, if yeah. any of you guys have like... I'm a rubber duck a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just there to ask questions and, make, and have them explain what it is their code is supposed to be doing and what it is actually doing. And like a lot of times it'll click on at some point and then go back and fix it. And sometimes it doesn't and I have to keep asking questions. And then eventually it's like, okay, let me show you. Um, and break out a text editor and then, okay, you got it? And then don't do it all. Right. Um, <laughs> and yeah. I find there's like a there's a balance that I'm always playing with like because this took me a year to a pain to learn. Sh should I just so what things do I just show you and help you leap forward so you become a developer faster because that's the whole point of you taking the course, right? And what parts do I, I let you struggle for a while so that you learn what the frustration is and, and actually learn and frustrate to this. So it's always like a balance of like I'm always having to choose, okay, at this point do I just Show them because the frustration is so high, and you just need to see it. Or do I actually struggle? And so, I mean, for me, yeah. I'm always just yeah. like in the moment, balance every time. The 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 way I've explained it is that it took me ten years basically to learn to learn Ruby in the course of learning HTML and what the web is in general and everything else, HTML and CSS and everything else. You know, it's ten years. And I'm fitting that into 12 weeks. <laughs> um, so you don't have time to sit there and beat your head against the wall for two days trying to figure out why this div isn't showing up. So instead, you take 20 minutes, <laughs> and then you find me. And I sort of short circuit that so that you can get on to the next problem. Um, so that you get a ton of error messages and problem solving and everything else in the course. So you'll suffer for short periods of yeah. free -forming. Yes, and not something too much on one thing. <laughs> Unless you had a problem uh, after 11 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got all that. Yes. Well, we're pretty pretty long meetings. We should probably call it. Although this is a pretty fun uh, discussion, I thought. Um, I do want to end at least this panel with one last question. I have another thing I want to cover before we all adjourn out there, drink more beer, what have you. Um, how do we sign up for your next course, and or when is your next course? Uh, I have a Ruby on Rails course that starts October 25th-ish, around that time, but 1150.com. Uh, that's spelled out, E-L-U, yeah, yeah. or 1150 Academy dollar, I think it's kind of on now, 1150.com. Yeah. My uh, next cohort is scheduled to start October 5th. Um, that might have a little better wiggle room depending on the breaks. Um, you can go to theironyard.com and then Indianapolis, and you should be able to 
sign up there and uh, go through all that stuff. Oh, and JavaScript is like 100%. Yeah. We're looking for a, and we're looking for a JavaScript instructor if anyone would like to take <laughs> <laughs> uh, If you want to find out about blocks, it's the www.block.io. And we have five courses, Rails. Well, we used to do courses. We used to do Rails, basically JavaScript, front end is what we call it, design, iOS, and Angular. Now we're into tracks where you can, the first part you can learn Ruby, the second part you can use, you can learn front end, which is Angular, JavaScript, it's CSS, which is a longer course. Um, yeah. But the experience you get in that is pretty amazing. So if you got somebody, you can pay them off. Uh, it's not cheap. <laughs> not how expensive it sounds. I mean, for the track, it's now 10000 and um, but you're in it for the, the fastest you can do it in 24 weeks. And I, mean, I, I would do it at least 36, 24 is brutal. Um, Same curriculum for over a long time. Well, no, you actually have, you, you do two courses now. You do the whole Rails course and you do the whole JavaScript course back to back. I mean, the 24 versus 36. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the 24 is 12 and 12, or 18 and 18. Okay. That's basically what it is now. Um, so very thorough, and it's very much like having your first job as a developer. Yeah, what about the iron yard? Is it, uh, what's the cost of the iron yard? Um, it is 12000 so it's 5000 a week. Um, we also offer scholarships for all manner of things, and uh, we're working on getting financing options available. <coughs> so so I, I should note that 1150 which is 2500 by the way, uh, per week, um, they also have apprenticeships. They don't have any Ruby apprenticeships at this point, but they have apprenticeships where you know, the first, after you take your class, the first month you could work for them. Um, but you, it would be like an unpaid internship, sort of, where um, they give you a tap, some user stories and stuff, and you build an app on your own. At the end of that 30 days, and you start getting $1,000 a month, and you get put on client projects. Then you get 2000 a month. And you end up at 4000 a month um, by the time you've been there six months, and you're working on real client projects that time. So it would literally be your first job. And sometimes, sometimes the client will hire you, and sometimes they won't. Yeah. And in our case, we do job placement afterwards. So like I said, demo days, we're going to invite people who are hiring developers, friends, family, like anybody from the community come down, see stuff, and actually do sort of initial interviews with our graduates to kind of get an idea um, of what they're about, what they can do, and all that sort of stuff. Um, so who are all the Iron students again? Yeah. 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 And again, graduation is next Friday. Which I'm excited about because I've been two weeks off. Twelve <laughs> weeks <laughs> to teach this dude to appreciate Reese's peanut butter cups. I, I had no idea. I was supposed to fix problems I don't know about. <laughs> well, that, that you know. Second, class, second quarter. We had we another person in the class who was just talking about how he didn't think peanut butter and chocolate belonged together. So then Andrew said that, and I'm just cracking up laughing after yeah, this conversation yeah. at all. But Pete and I get along. <laughs> one last thing: if any one of those five courses into you about mentoring and you. Like work for yourself. If you have extra time, and extra money. You can talk to me. Just uh, put you in the track, possibly even for, probably even for great deals. I don't do this. Cool. Uh, so that kind of leads into the thing I wanted to. One thing I wanted to say before we leave: uh, whose companies are hiring right now? All right. So that'd be Salesforce, Moby. Lessonly, yep. yeah, Satani, awesome. Yep, interactive intelligence. But probably not so much for Ruby. Okay. But yeah. plenty if you want to do JavaScript or something. Parking lot sounds interesting to you. <laughs> 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 I'm going to check and plug it verbally at the same time. The Indie Hackers job board. <laughs> uh, uh, the Odyssey it's JavaScript. That's not really applicable here. Oh, um, Health Pro is uh, looking for a Rubyist that also likes DevOps things. Moby, Lessonly, and Little Stake. So, anybody else? Did I miss anybody? We're looking for uh, Excel people. <laughs> <laughs> where, where at? Is it our Raytheon. Okay. The defense industry. We are looking to oh, hire yeah. people. Sponsor our help is hiring as well, right? 
I hear they're going to be in Dillo Bags. Cool. You're going to be in Dillo Bags. You know that? Probably everybody will be there. I would like to be there. All right, one last word, but not from me. Okay, I'm Erica. You guys didn't catch it at the beginning. And um, I'm one of the co leaders for Girl Develop It. So if you know of anybody who's interested in getting into coding, but they're maybe not quite sure what they want to do and maybe don't want to get into the financial part of it so early on, we do offer introductory classes. Um, they're kind of short periods, they're either like one night, and those are usually about $20, or they're over the course of four nights, and those are about $60 to $80. So if you know someone who wants to get into it, um, Girl Develop It Indies on Meetup. And is it, we're, oh. is it No, it's not. <laughs> we, mostly, we mostly are geared towards getting women into development, um, but we do have guys in almost every class, and then we have a lot of teachers and TAs as well. Um, I'm hoping to offer a Ruby class in November. We're still looking for a teacher. There's been a lot of interest for TAs, so if someone would like to teach, it would probably be four different nights, two hours each night. Yeah. I never part of your email. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so you know she's dependable. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm just the world's worst emailer. I swear. Well, I imagine there are a lot of people in this room that could buy for that title. Yeah. Not, me included. So. That's okay. I log into FlowDoc and never say a word. No, of course, you know, I'm, I'm doing my project and I don't have time to type, but then I see you guys make snarky comments and just giggle <laughs> while I'm typing. Yeah, that's, that's what it's there for. But most of what we do, and like, yeah, it's morale, we do have pictures. Basically, it's, the, it's a microcosm of the internet right there. Did you ever read that? That's not true. It's, it's not nearly as terrible as No, no. <laughs> Hopefully, you do not lose all faith in Mary in the first 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> YouTube. That was, uh, we, we had a final project that I killed by just asking, what are you going to do with the YouTube comment problem? And I was like, oh, yeah, I hadn't thought about the fact that people are awful. It's interesting, because like, individuals are great, just people are terrible. Yeah. Uh, Alright, on that note. <laughs> yeah. Good times, people. I love you all. <laughs> Individually. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Just don't have to scare each other so you find out how terrible you are. <laughs> all right. Thanks to our instructors for uh, <laughs>